Dividend investing, it requires the investor to be really strong. Sometimes it's almost like going to battle. Dividend investing, it requires strength and persistence. And I wanna go through some examples today why that's the case. And I wanna share some examples, not only how that's the case for the individual investor, but how it's the case for the very companies that we all invest in. It's funny, I uh, receive a lot of comments on my channel here on YouTube, and um, one of my favorite comments from recent videos was, give, give Ian some shades, and it's a, like a thug life moment. All of you have probably seen over the years those thug life videos, they're pretty funny. Well, I've got my shades today, I've got my shades. So you're gonna see there are some thug life moments in today's video. I'm gonna share a new position that I own in my portfolio that I've never shared before. And let's, let's just get strong here. This is all about strength, persistence. Let's go to battle, let's battle for our financial freedom, for our dividends, for our cash flow. Get ready, this is gonna be a really, really fun video. So I want to start out with something. I just did a video. I celebrated my 10,000 subscribers. I'm so grateful to everyone out there, the community. What an amazing community here. I'm just so blessed. I'm going to link in the description below to that video, to that video celebrating 10,000 subscribers. But one of the things I did is I shared in that video, hey, I own this stock, Unilever. And this is a company that is based out of the Netherlands and London the UK, and it has a dual structure. This dual structure, there's two entities. Historically, it's had the uh, Dutch entity, the, the NV, and it's had the British PLC, and uh, the British version was uh, based out of London, the Dutch version based out of Rotterdam, and um, correspondingly for US investors, it's had two tickers with the American depository receipts. It's had the UL ticker, which is the one I own, the London version, and the UN, the Dutch version, which is the one I don't own. The reason I went with the UL version, by the way, is there's no foreign tax withholding, whereas the Dutch version, there's a 15% foreign tax withholding, although that may go away with time because I heard that there's some talks between the uh, Dutch government, the US government, they're gonna figure out um, potentially a uh, tax treaty like the US has with, um, with the UK. We'll see, I don't wanna hold my breath. For now, I'm just assuming it's that 15%. Anyways, uh, this has been the structure. This has been the structure since the 1930. That has been the structure of Unilever. And for those that don't know, Unilever, it's a very big company, multinational company, a lot of products. Dove Soap is one of the products that they make. Axe uh, Spray, for example, is one of the products that they make. Lipton Iced Teas, Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream. The list goes on and on and on. I love these guys. Anyways, they're facing some disruption. Things were going real steady since 1930. They had that structure since 1930, real steady. One day, guess who comes along? One of my favorite people, Kraft Heinz. If you've, <laughs> you've been watching my channel for a while, you know about my experience with Heinz and Kraft. I'm gonna link in the description below. Check it out, check out that, um, that video. Anyways, these guys come along, and this is ridiculous, quite frankly. Kraft Heinz, $77 billion market cap. Unilever, $149 billion market cap. Kraft Heinz comes along and they're like, hey, we wanna buy you, Unilever, even though you're twice our, our size, you're a national treasure of the Netherlands, you're one of the most amazing global companies, we're gonna come in with all this swagger and try to buy you. And you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna do this because we did the same thing with Heinz, and we're just gonna try to strong arm our way in and buy this company. Well, you know what? They shut down that acquisition. These guys shut it down. That's why I crossed out Kraft Heinz, and right there, Who's, um, who's Thug Life there? That is our friends at Unilever. Well done, well done Unilever. Great job shutting that down. Anyways, they shut it down, but what they learned in this process, and by the way, who wins here? The Netherlands win, Unilever wins, the shareholders win. This takeover, in my opinion, would have been absolutely ridiculous. But what's great about this is they, they took this opportunity to analyze what happened. And what happened is in London, in the UK, takeover laws make it really easy, easy, easy for other companies to come in and try to take you over. 
Well, you know what happened after this? Unilever said, you know what? Even though we've been doing this since 1930, we're gonna change what we're doing and we are going to close down our, um, our structure in London and we are going to have our corporate offices and our corporate structure just in the Netherlands. They're gonna do it in Rotterdam. And the reason that they're gonna do this well, they don't come out and say this. They, the reason they're doing it is to cut costs and to be more streamlined. And I think that alone is a good reason. It's going to save the shareholders like myself some, some money. It's gonna make the company more profitable. But the other reason they're doing this, quite frankly, at least based on some of the stipulations by the analysts, is to make it much more difficult. For people like Kraft Heinz, it's gonna be much more difficult to come in and take them over because the laws to take over a company based on the Netherlands, they're much stricter. And so anyways, this is smart thinking, they win. Unilever had to go to battle here. They had to go to battle with Kraft Heinz. They won victoriously. I'm very proud of them because it benefits shareholders like myself who are in this forever. I wanna be in this for a very, very long time. I don't wanna sell. I certainly don't want Kraft Heinz to buy them and, um, and potentially muddy the waters. And so I'm really happy having this a sovereign company based out of the Netherlands, not getting bought by Kraft Heinz. Let it be, let them create shareholder value, let them do what they do best. And it's an example of a company that's been steady eddy for a long time. I shouldn't say steady eddy, they've grown quite a bit, but the corporate structure at least for, for a long time since 1930, but they had to innovate here. And um, I, think, I think the subscribers who pointed this out, I actually wasn't even up to speed on a lot of this stuff until there were some questions on my last video. I did my research and um, I like it. I like it a lot. Anyways, I wanna go on to another example. So they went to battle and they won. Hawaiian Electric, this is a company that I own. Small company, a, a utility. I've owned this one for a while. I bought um, first like major purchase in shares that I started buying was in 2010. I've never discussed this one, by the way, before. Um, before this video and it's a um, smaller company plus or minus three billion dollar market cap obviously based out of hawaii they power the electricity for hawaii and uh, they also own a bank as well i think it's the third largest bank i believe if i remember correctly in um, the state of hawaii anyways um just some background because i've never shared this one before they pay a dividend per share of a dollar 24 um i purchased this stock in 2010 for 20 dollars and change so um, my yield on cost is pretty darn good. It's $1.24 divided by 20, 6.2% yield on cost. By the way, the folks at Hawaiian, um, Hawaiian Electric, they don't really raise the dividend over time. It's just flat, it's just steady eddy. The reason I like this company is because it's predictable. It's a well-run business. I love Hawaii. And I'm gonna do a whole video on this, so I don't wanna get into too much detail here, but this is one of these uh, companies in my portfolio. It's just a steady, steady dividend payer day in day out they do what they need to do and i'm getting my 6.2 percent yield on cost it's not going to grow much but um, i am happy with that in fact i've done a video before where i talked about trading ranges trading range stocks and there's certain stocks that are trading ranges this is one of them i typically only buy hawaiian electric if i see the price at about 25 dollars or less if it's above 25 which it is now it's at um 34.56 I'm not really a buyer here, it's just up too high. In fact, I'm up 73% on this purchase price, this $20, $20 and change uh, purchase price, just on capital appreciation alone, not counting the dividend. But anyways, um, I like the company, it's a great company, I'm gonna talk about it more. Smaller company, I like it because it's a small cap um, in my portfolio, and just, you, you guys know I really like utilities because they provide some current cash flow. Not a ton of dividend growth, but good current cash flow. If I need to tap into my dividends tomorrow, I can do so. I can do that, and I love utilities for that. Anyways, who comes along? Next Era Energy. 2014, Next Era Energy comes along, and they're like, hey, Hawaiian Electric, we're gonna buy you guys. We're gonna buy you out. This one kind of hit home for me because I see a lot of this go down in Hawaii and I hope there's subscribers watching right now from Hawaii and I don't like a lot of this stuff. I'll tell you what happens. People come into Hawaii that are not from Hawaii and uh, they try to um, buy an entire island or they try to buy all this property and set up all these walls so their neighbors can't enjoy the scenery anymore. There's all kinds of things like that that happen. I personally think that it's wrong and I think that 
I, I kind of look the same way at, at uh, Unilever. That's how I look at it. Like, look, this is a treasure of the Netherlands. Let's let it be. Let's let it do its thing. Let's let the people of the Netherlands run this company. Same kind of thing with Hawaiian Electric. This is a Hawaiian company. This has been in operation, quite frankly, since the 1800s. It's been around forever. Who is Next Era Energy to come in and try to take this thing over from the Hawaiian people when they're... In my opinion, the, this is a company that should be part of Hawaii and should be independently run out of Hawaii. I have strong opinions on it. It's just how I feel from a values standpoint. And so when something like this happens, I don't really like it. Anyways, the two companies were trying to figure out, they're trying to merge. Thank goodness this PUC, Hawaii has something called the Public Utilities Commission. They had to vote on whether this acquisition would go through. It was a heated debate. Thankfully, they voted and they shot it down. Again, this here, in my opinion, is another thug life moment. So I got to put on the shades. My hat's off to, this, to the strong-willed people at the PUC in Hawaii. I commend you for shooting down this acquisition. Let this company run independently. Let's not look at short-term gains. The stock market is not, in my opinion, the vehicle to be buying low, selling high. I am in this for the long term. I'm in it for the dividends. I'm an owner in Hawaiian Electric and I want to own it for the long term. I want to own it forever. I don't want Next Era Energy coming along and trying to disrupt this company, giving a nice little short term blip in, in capital appreciation. Look, I'm already up 73% on my initial purchase. I don't really care about that. It doesn't affect me. I'm in it for the dividends and my money is tied up because I believe in this company. I have no need to sell it. So I don't need someone coming in and buying this thing out. And so this is another example of going to battle. And this was a different case because Hawaiian Electric and Next Era, I think they were both trying to figure it out. But you know who went to battle? The PUC, the Hawaiian PUC went to battle, they did that. And in my humble opinion, it greatly benefited shareholders um, like myself. I'm so proud of them, I'm so proud of the outcome. And this is what I'm talking about, folks. Dividend investing, we'll get into some more personal examples later on the personal front, but even at the company front, for the companies that we're all investing in, every day they're going to battle. And so sometimes, I get a lot of comments here. I get a lot of comments like, Ian, I'm scared. Are they going to get taken over? Are they going to go out of business? Are they going to lose revenue? Are there disruptors coming in? Is Amazon going to do something? All of the above. Every single day, these companies that we invest in, that we place our trust in, they are going to battle. And sometimes the company's not going to battle. The PUC is going to battle. But you know what? When one has a well-diversified portfolio, they're in it for the long run, it tends to work out a good amount of the time. And these are two cases where it has um, it has worked out, quite frankly, in my opinion, for dividend investors. So let's look at an example where it didn't work out so well. Dr. Pepper Snapple. I don't want to go into this in too much detail. I'll link in the description below. I've done two videos on it. Basically, they got bought out by um, private equity and got brought public again as part of Keurig. And um, this is fine. I made I made a lot of money on this stock in terms of capital appreciation. It was up um, up several hundred percent, and um, I was unhappy at the time because I just bought this. I want to hold it forever for the dividend. But you know what? In the end of the day, it all worked out in the sense that, quite frankly, I took some of the money out of this thing and I, I bought Pepsi for $96 and change, PepsiCo. I got in at 96, I can't believe it. Some of my, my purchases thereafter were at higher price points and Pepsi's been trending up now, but I locked in 96 thanks to the timing of all this and I just sold out of Dr. Pepper Snapple um, so I didn't wanna deal with the, um, the whole reorg. Anyways, this is an example of a company, look, it turned out for the best, and I believe for dividend investors, things tend to turn out for the best, but they failed. They went to battle. Well, I don't know if anyone went to battle there. There was no battle. There should have been a battle, but they just lost. If anything, they should have extracted more money for this, um, for this acquisition by the Keurig company and this repackaging, all, all of that kind of stuff. They should have extracted a lot more money, but I don't know if anyone went to battle, so I guess there was a battle, but the only one that really lost is the shareholders, in my opinion. But anyways, um, it doesn't always uh, work out in one's favor. From what I can see now, and things may change in the future, with Unilever, Hawaiian Electric, things worked out pretty, pretty darn well. With Dr. Pepper, 
Yeah, it's still good for for uh, I, I ma- for myself certainly. I imagine a lot of other investors who had seen a lot of capital appreciation. But I still think we would have been better off if we just held for the long term. But you win some, you lose some. Certainly, this isn't. If this is me losing, making several hundred percent and redeploying into Pepsi at ninety six, I'm happy with that. But um, still, not all battles are won. So. I want to talk about something else next. There's this guy, Adin Karnazes. I found him through London Real, actually. This is a podcast that I really enjoy. I'll link in the description below to a, to a video review I did of that. I'm wearing today my running outfit. I'm wearing this because I went running today. I did um, a good six miles, um, all hills, in the heat of the day, during my lunch break. Uh, I don't know how hot out it was, at least 80 degrees. and. I like to embrace my inner Dean. This is the guy that ran 50, my, uh, 50 marathons in 50 different states in 50 days. That's right, he ran a marathon a day for 50 days. And he is routinely doing things like this. He is always pushing himself. I remember in one of his interviews, I think it was the London Real one, he said in some of these races, it's like every cell in his body, it hurts. And when I'm running, I try to push myself pretty hard when I'm doing any kind of exercise. and. It's that interesting realization that not everything is meant to be easy. Not everything is meant to be straightforward. There are battles in life. There are battles in investing. There are battles even when one is working out and doing their running. If one just pushes themselves a little, that's not what it's all about. Put aside the health aspects of it, the um, building muscle, losing fat, eating healthy, all of that. Just thinking about the mental side of it, because a lot of the running, it's mental. What Dean taught me through all these videos I've watched uh, and podcasts I've watched is that sometimes the, um, the challenge is what it's all about. Sometimes the battle is what it's all about. It's about thinking about things in that way. And so anyways, investing, it's not easy. These companies don't have it easy. The uh, PUC doesn't have it easy. The shareholders don't have it easy. No one has it easy. It's, it's going to battle. And it's setting oneself up for that right frame of mind. And so when you're investing, are you just thinking, hey, I'm just going to invest, put some money together? Or are you really thinking, what's my strategy? How am I going to win this? What are my core strengths? Am I going to be in it for a long time? Do I have the strong will to succeed? And so I want to bring it. I want to bring it down here. How tough are you? How tough am I? This is a fundamental question that dividend investors need to wrap their hands around because there's this allure. There's this allure out there and I get comments all the time. I've done a few videos on dividend investing versus growth investing. I'll link in the description below. I personally respect all investors. Dividend investors, growth investors, I I think they're all great. Anyone taking command of their personal finances. Obviously, you know which uh, side of the debate I personally fall into. But there's this allure of buy low, sell high. I tend to think that, that growth investing, not long, long-term growth investing, but the trading that comes up, it's kind of the easy way out. Oh, I'm gonna buy here, sell here five years later, make some money, do it again. In my opinion, and that's fine, if it works for people, it works for people, that short-term trading or medium-term trading. But dividends, dividend investing, to have life-changing dividends come in that can be used to pay all of the bills, to have that income come through the doors while you are sleeping that can pay for either some or even all of your bills. My goal is to have it to pay for all of my bills one day. That requires strength. That requires Dean Karnazes type strength. Requires at certain points it's gonna be painful. And so my question is, and something you should be thinking about, I should be thinking about is, how tough are you? What's gonna happen when there's a market correction? Talking a big correction, what if what if my portfolio value over the next few months loses half its value because the, the market just tanks? How am I gonna deal with that? Am I tough enough to stick through it? We'll see. Next one, mistakes. I made my share of mistakes. I'm gonna link in the description below. I make mistakes all the time. I'm gonna link to my top five mistakes. When I make a mistake, am I gonna let it derail me? If I've made mistakes in the past, even in the present, am I gonna let let that uh, give up on my dreams, give up on my dividend investing strategy? Or am I gonna learn from the mistake and move on, even if it sets me back quite a bit? What am I gonna do if I make a huge mistake that just sets me back? Am I gonna be tough enough to get through that? We'll see. Critics, I get them here sometimes. I'm sure all of you get them. Sometimes we're our own critics. What are you gonna do when someone criticizes your dividend strategy or your investing strategy? Are you gonna let them get you off focus? Are you gonna let them change your strategy towards something different that molds more towards the customary buy low, sell high? 
how are you going to approach that? Are you going to approach it with, with strength and, and being tough? It's an important question. Takeovers. How are you going to approach this stuff? Takeovers happen. Thank goodness it didn't happen with Unilever. Thank goodness it didn't happen with Hawaiian Electric. I approach it through diversification and when a takeover does happen and I don't like it, like in Dr. Pepper, I'll make the best of it and I'll, I'll take my gains, I'll pay my taxes and I will make the best reallocation of the capital possible at the time. But um, takeovers are just messy. They, they're distracting. They distract everyone. They're, they're just part of the game, part of the game. But how are you going to deal with takeovers? Let's say you're just getting started. You own one stock in your portfolio and gets taken out and you're not really happy about the takeover. Is it going to affect your strategy going forward for the next 30 years or next 20 years of dividend investing? Or is it going to help build some character, some strength, some toughness in one's dividend strategy? What else? Expense management. One of the number one things in dividend growth investing is getting one's expenses under control. This is an area where I have so much to learn. I love um, spending money on certain things. I've gotten better over the years, but I still have a lot to learn. How tough, how tough is one gonna be when the big expenses come up, when one maybe can't get a handle around their expenses, maybe they're not saving enough money, maybe the, the um, expenses are high enough, so high where one doesn't have much money left for dividends. How are, how are you going to approach it? How am I going to approach it? It has to be approached um, with a tough attitude, with a strength a attitude of strength and persistence, quite frankly, because maybe it's a journey. Maybe the answer won't come overnight, but it'll take some time. What else? Persistence. This is the last one. The number one thing that I think makes or breaks the dividend investor is the persistence. Everyone's going to face the challenges. Everyone's going to face all of this kind of stuff over the years. How is one going to face it? Hopefully with some persistence. With the persistence, in my opinion, is what it's all about in the stock market. And so it ultimately comes down to how bad do you want this? How bad do you want income coming in that can cover your living expenses? I want it pretty bad. I, um, I am going to be, in I have been and I'll continue to be tough. I'll make mistakes along the way. I'll have challenges along the way, but I'll get there. And we need to know is both on an individual investor level, like myself, but also on a company level, these battles are going to be fought. There's going to be these battles and that just comes with the territory of dividend investing. And if one can understand that going into it, one can remind themselves of that throughout the journey. That's where the best dividend investors are built, in my humble opinion. So just a fun video today. Had to do it because I loved those comments on my last video about this. Thank you. This is such a great community. I love these insights. I hadn't even really looked into this. And um, you guys got me looking at this, thinking about this. And then I was running today and I started thinking, hey, I got to do a whole video about this stuff because it's all a battle. Whether I'm out there running and I'm pushing for my best there or it's in my finances, I'm pushing for my best there. I got to do my best in that battle and um, keep keep tough. And so I appreciate that. Before I leave today, I want to do a full disclosure. In terms of full disclosure, I am long. I own the following stocks. Unilever, ticker symbol UL. Hawaiian Electric, ticker symbol HE. And um, PepsiCo, ticker symbol PEP. I own those stocks in my portfolio. Also, in terms of a friendly disclaimer, today's video is not investment advice. I'm not a licensed investment advisor. This video is just for your fun and entertainment. If you're going to go out and invest in the stock market or anywhere else, please consult a licensed financial advisor first. Hey, thanks everyone. If you enjoyed the video, I please invite you to subscribe, to comment, to like, all of that. It really means the world to me. It's the best way you can motivate me towards um, raising the bar with each and every video. I'm so, so happy with the community here and with all of the great feedback that is rolling in. And I wish you all of the best in your dividend investing portfolio, in your finances, in your life. And I will see you in the next video.